And in the last five years, there's been a new molecule discovered called hepcidin. Brand new. We didn't know this even existed. This is a circulating protein that's made by the liver that controls body iron balance. And it's been shown in hemochromatosis that most people have a low hepcidin. And that sends a signal to increase iron absorption. So it seems like in hemochromatosis, it's an inappropriate response. You've already got too much iron in some cases. You shouldn't have a low hepcidin. You should have a high hepcidin. Now, how do you study the effects of diet in hemochromatosis or in anything? This is not an easy problem. Many of you probably can't even remember what you had for breakfast. We, again, turned to experts at the NIH in the AIR study, and we used this very standardized food frequency questionnaire, which was 40 pages. And it goes into a computer that spits out how many grams of iron you're ingesting per day, and also splits it into different forms of iron, heme iron and non-heme iron. So it was a very detailed analysis. Then we were able to plot the amount of iron that was going in versus the serum ferritin in everybody who was detected in the air study, and we showed no correlation, none. So we published this again, it was sort of one of these heresy documents that you can eat whatever you want because it doesn't make any difference. And how could that possibly be? It's probably because that system that I explained to you about hepcidin controlling your body iron is not completely broken. It's only partially broken. So in most people, if they ate a whole bunch of iron, the body would react by just pooping it out. It wouldn't be absorbed. So some of those control mechanisms must still be at play in hemochromatosis. So, you know, usually when I talk to patients about this, I tell them that they don't have to be on any dietary restrictions. I don't think they should be taking iron pills. There should be no need for supplements if you're on a decent diet. You certainly shouldn't be taking vitamin C. Now, in Australia, they've done detailed dietary studies as well. They've shown a slight, a very slight improvement in vegan people, not vegetarian people. So that's quite a restrictive diet. There are some other factors in diet that people are interested in. For example, English tea decreases iron absorption. Now, you have to drink a lot of it. You have to be drinking it all day. Some of our patients are doing that. They've done that for years. They like that. What else can raise ferritin? When you're very obese, you have an inflammatory disease in your liver, sometimes called fatty liver, NASH, steatohepatitis. Anything that's itis is inflammation. And that drives up ferritin. So anybody with any inflammation, like chronic back pain, like osteoarthritis, can have elevations in ferritin. And what about alcohol? When I was in Australia, we decided that we would study this not in humans, we'd study it in medical students. So <laughs> we, we offered them two free beers a day. Can you imagine Australia? They just couldn't wait to get into this study. Now, they, they had to drink the beer in front of us. And we measured their ferritin day by day, later week by week. And over a month, it just went up and up and up. How high does it go? 800, you know, it, it goes up and up and up. And then we took cultured liver cells and added ethanol to the cultured liver cells that were growing in the test tube. And we could show that ferritin synthesis increased. So ethanol stimulates ferritin in your body. And that's not the same as having iron overload. Can hemochromatosis patients drink? Uh, you, the answer is yes. I think if you have cirrhosis, it's probably not a great idea to be drinking. Uh, the, the best amount of alcohol for anybody is zero. Uh, the second best would be less than two drinks a day. So if you don't have cirrhosis, you could probably squeeze into that under two drinks a day. But we do know that heavy alcohol makes the scarring process of hemochromatosis worse.